Uh, welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I am your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Tony Ricci. If you're a first-time listener, hit the subscribe button and like the show. You can find us on YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Our special guest today is Dr. Andy Galpin. He is a tenured full professor at Cal State University in Fullerton. I'm not even sure where Fullerton is. Maybe Tony knows. I um, know exactly where it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, where he is the uh, he's also the co-director of the Center for Sport Performance and founder slash director of the Biochemistry and Molecular Exercise Physiology Lab. He is a human perform performance scientist with a PhD in human bio bioenergetics. In over 100 peer-reviewed pubs and presentations, Dr. Galpin has worked with elite athletes, including all-star, all-pro, MVP, Cy Young, Olympic gold medalists, major winners, uh, world titleists, contenders, etc. across the UFC, MLB, NBA, PGA, NFL, boxing, Olympics, and military special forces, and more. I feel like I'm at a, at a Texas auction. Um, yeah. You could have cut well. about half of that out or more. <laughs> yeah. He's also co-founder in Absolute Rest Biomolecular Athlete Vitality Blueprint, and rapid health and performance. So, Dr. Galpin, welcome to our wacky podcast. Man, it's it's a pleasure and honor. Um, you guys are uh, two just giants in the field, man. So it's a, it's been fun to to follow your footsteps, if you will, in the, in the high performance field. Kind of this uh, blending of of science and application and communication. So I uh, appreciate all the work you guys have done. And it's an honor to be here. Hey, thanks, Andy. And, uh, you know, it took me a while. I've known Tony for many, many years. And uh, I always, tr you know, I, talk I tr talked to him into moving to Florida. He lived in New York for quite a while. I know he never, he was uh, uh, sad to leave it, although he's not so sad now since, actually, since you're in California, you get the same weather. It's like beautiful. There's no snow. I mean, it's like perfect here. So, you know, we're you, the three of us, we're spoiled when it comes to weather. We don't really have winter. And I would imagine, Andy, there's not a winter where you are. Yeah, not really. It's the same every day here. <laughs> no, but you go hunting in that cold weather a lot, Andy. I see you do that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My big jam. Yeah. I'm a hey, mountain I'm guy, man. I prefer to be in the mountains. No offense to anybody here who prefers the beach. Uh, I don't know anybody maybe who's listening or potentially sitting in a chair who likes to be in the water most days or on boards. I think that stuff is a waste. I'd be in the mountains <laughs> any day over top of the beach. <laughs> we are beach boys, but I, I've been wasting most of my life anyway, so it wouldn't matter to me to keep going. Um, hey, let's start with this, Andy. I know you, uh, the skeletal muscle physiology stuff is fascinating. And um, Tony and I had Mike Roberts on the show, um, I think a week or two ago, and we had some really great discussions about muscle physiology. It tends to be an esoteric subject because for most people, particularly in our field, it tends to be very applied. So you don't really get into the details of muscle phys, although I love the stuff and, you know, Tony loves it. He may not get into the nitty gritty detail, but it, you know, it's super cool stuff. And, um, there was a paper that you had mentioned on social media, which sort of made the rounds. And just so I let the audience know what the title of it is, so it'll jar your memory. It was fusion of myofiber branches is a physiological feature of healthy human skeletal muscle regeneration. And it was by a group in Denmark. I can't pronounce their names. Um, but basically, this group claims that fusion, not not splitting, but fusion explains the branching of small muscle uh, fiber segments. Um, and I want you to explain basically the nuts and bolts of it to the audience who may not be, you know, muscle physiologists, what they found. And then I actually have some questions, not doubting their conclusions, but I think there are certainly things that could be asked where uh, the methodology, which again is quite esoteric, may not actually answer the question based on their conclusion so yeah well it's actually interesting to talk to you of all people about this i don't know if the listeners know your background in this particular area um it's, it's quite funny given what you do with your career you know most probably infamous for but people don't realize you know your contributions to, to this part of the field so um yeah again interesting to, to have that conversation with you but the, the here's the very quick background you know going back to your i think it was your dissertation yeah it was. What it was, right um, there's there's always been this thing, and I've been an outspoken advocate <laughs> my entire career uh, about the fact that I think muscle hyperplasia um, happens. And so there's no question that, that it happens in people. The real question and contention is, does hyperplasia happen 
in the presence of normal, healthy people with things like basic exercise. Like that's the, that's the area. We know what certainly happens with decades of anabolic steroids, specifically testosterone. We know what happens in overuse or stretching models, like things like that. That's just beyond reproach. So if you're unaware, hyperplasia really means, do you add additional muscle fibers? We know they grow, that's hypertrophy. And we know lots of things about the myofilaments and myofibrils, but to the actual muscle cells, do you increase the amount? And so all that aside, we're really talking about this. This is kind of why you started the conversation. Like we're, this is a pretty niche little thing here. Um, I've always been convinced that it does happen. Uh, it certainly does not happen within the first like six days or six weeks of training. It's not the first thing. It's not explaining newbie gains. It's not explaining, you know, things like that. Other mechanisms are to the play there. And so really this is a challenging area because you probably have to look many, 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 many months, if not years before you're going to have a chance to see something and happen. So you're not gonna be able to do really longitudinal study on people nonetheless. And so more recently, um, probably in the last seven or eight years, people have said, okay, it's not necessarily that you grow new muscle fibers. But what happens is they branch. And so we have this new terminology that's kind of conflated a lot of the times with hyperplasia, which is muscle fiber branching. And so instead of a growing a new muscle cell out of nothing, what you have is an individual fiber branches off and creates a new segment. And so that will actually looks that, that research looks somewhat promising. And the reason you're getting this, I can tell you behind the scenes, it's because when you take a muscle biopsy of somebody, which I've done hundreds of times, of, it's very, very challenging to image that muscle fiber without some distortion. Mm -hmm. So you take that muscle fiber out of a human being, it gets smashed with your tweezers, it gets um, dehydrated, even you know, mild, mild, mild amounts, um, the changes the complexion. So you're not going to get these perfectly cylinder, like perfect you know, uh, objects to image. So when you're trying to identify size, it's not this perfect circle. It's smashed in one corner. It's like, it's all, it's like a four-year-old drew a circle. Like it's just all over the place, right? So now you're trying to make inferences about actual diameter with this, this weird or cross-sectional area the way you're doing it. Now, when you do it with histochemistry the old way, which you guys did, it's sort of like you cut a slice and you image hundreds, hopefully of fibers to get like an average. But the new ways is you actually put individual muscle fibers themselves one by one into high powered microscopes, which is what we do. And so now because of that, you you can't do hundreds of fibers. Like you, you have commonly studies that have done, you know, five, 10, 20 fibers, like per time point per person. Like, like, so you're making a lot of judgments based on one biopsy of one part of one muscle and a few you know, a few fibers that are hundreds of thousands exist in that muscle. And, so, and which, which muscle, uh, what's the muscle of choice when you do this? Almost always the vastus lateralis. So the so, outside quadricep muscle. So you're talking hundreds, more... hundreds of thousands of muscle fibers and you're using a few grams. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a few milligrams. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting really yeah. down there. I mean, literally, you'll find papers that have used five fibers. Yeah eight fibers. Like that's not 20, 20 is super common in the field. Um, again, perhaps another day, another conversation, I can certainly tell you of many labs and I'm like, man, I don't basically trust anything that comes out of the lab because they'll use those things. Like, and so you, there's just so much manipulation that can happen there, um, overtly or just because of chosen validated methodologies. It's just, you know, everything has a pro and a con, right? So it's not scientists just making things up. So that's kind of the, the, the foundation and background of the story. And so what Abigail's paper found, um, Abigail Mackey is, is the, um, I think it was out of her lab that, that had this stuff. And, and she's great, um, does a ton of good stuff out of there. And she what she basically found was the conclusion of that paper was it's not actually growing and splitting of muscle fibers outward. What you're seeing is fibers are fusing together. And that's the fusion part of it. And so she's basically saying you're seeing the wrong time point. You think you're seeing them branching and creating more muscle fibers. What you're seeing is them coming together after damage is effectively, it's effectively what she found. And there's been a little bit of like hint about that stuff coming, but hers is the first real paper. And um, last thing I'll say is I actually appreciated the title and I appreciate it. Actually, I don't even fully agree with it. I'm sort of on your side, but I appreciated the fact that they came out and made it like really clear and direct what they were trying to say. And so the readers weren't just like left in this confusingly awful title and like not knowing what's going on. It was like, oh, okay, great. And so she put a little stamp on it, um, which I, I, I think I, I tweeted at the start of time. I'm like, oh my gosh, like another blow to my heart on hyperplasia. <laughs> but uh, it was more of like a, a jest there because it's not it's not the end of the story for sure. Right. He um, in that paper. Okay, so 
And I remember Mike Roberts, when he was on the show, we talked about this, that when you look at these, you know, what we're trying to do is paint a, a show of, we're making conclusions on a video. We're looking for video, but it's really still picture, uh, still photos oh. we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So it's a dynamic process. And, and I think that's, that's one of the um, sort of drawbacks of, you know, the technology as it is. The other one is, um, you know, and to your point of we're looking at so few muscle fibers for a given muscle that, you know, it would be like plucking, you know, three people out of a thousand and making generalities about that population of a thousand. And, and actually might be worse than that. It's way worse than that. Yeah. It's, it's, way, it's way worse than that. It's more like three out of 300,000. Right. Yeah. Right. And so what what i did and a lot of people aren't familiar with this with the i actually dissected every muscle fiber of the anterior latissimus dorsi and it's and it's a small muscle i mean it's like the tip of my pinky uh roughly you know 1500 to 3000 muscle fibers but i manually dissected each and every one of them and it's a painstaking process that's why nobody wants to do it and the control is the other side of the animal so you have a stretch side a control side the control side had no split fibers. Yeah. The overloaded side had, I think, if, if I recall the data, it was like four to five percent were splitting. So I don't buy this fusion stuff because I'm I visually saw muscle fiber splitting. They, I mean, there's no fusion. And also the splitting uh was concomitant with it with a total increase in muscle fiber based on direct, you know, nitric acid digestion, direct counts. So the problem with the fusion story is that it would mean muscle fiber number doesn't go up and may actually go down, which again, teleologically doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? So I'm sorry, Andy, can I just ask here? So in fusion, we're talking the literally almost a bonding, then it's a, a single sarcolemma from two. I mean, are we becoming one cell? Is that, is that the, the physical construct of what we're talking about here? Yeah. So you have a bunch of different ways of muscle can hypertrophy. The most traditional way is what you'll hear in like a textbook is the right. sarc right, sarcomere just sort of extending, right? Yep. Um, and actually, I think there was another paper I just saw like uh, maybe last week, Thursday, something like super recent, uh, kind of putting a stamp further down on myofibrils just like going up. So myofibril count is going gonna to go up. So the question is like, how are we getting there? So yeah, what you're, what you're probably seeing are, are things branching out. Now, what's also interesting is like, you have a time point issue, right? So it's like, <laughs> there's a little bit of a, of a problem there. Like, not necessarily a problem, but it, it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of, well, where are you catching this thing at? Um, you know, what, what part of that phase and part of that cycle are you getting it at? So really in order to get this, you would have to have a lot more um, biopsies to, to figure out what's going on. The other like huge, 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 huge issue is I can tell you right now, if you take, and, and there's data, there's lots of data on this. If you take a muscle biopsy of, of one muscle, even a tiny one, like even if you were to done that in, in, the, in the, the cats or, or whatever, like yours was in a cat, right? We did birds, cats, and rats. Birds, cats, and rats. Yeah. Okay. If you do this in a human though, you're going to see very different fiber type profiles just from two biopsies in a row. Right. In the same muscle, two biopsies in a row, you're going to see different fiber type profiles. So the fact that you're unlikely to see like different things, like amount of fibers, um, a brain, like those characteristics that are that down and prone to what's the biopsy itself doing? What was the tissue manipulation doing? Now, again, they're controlling for a lot of these things. They're not just, you know, junk science. Again, the lab is very, very good. But, but you're going to have all kinds of problems, right? And then last thing to consider is we also, we also have enough evidence right now at this point to realize that muscle hypertrophy in the whole muscle does not happen uniformly across the proximal to dorsal. So, so, it, so it does not happen at the same point on your hip as it does towards your knee and if the VL towards the middle, towards the belly, it's not the same everywhere. So when you're taking a sample like that, you're getting one picture at one spot. And we know that that doesn't happen. In fact, we know actually to add on one more thing, the fiber type of an individual muscle cell isn't even the same throughout the entire cell. Yeah, right. Wow. It's not even the same. So like, like there's just a lot of stuff to go on. So I, I love the paper. I thought it was super interesting and fun. Uh, but I'm not I'm not ready to get rid of, of hyperplasia at all uh, based on that. And nor should you with one paper. That's not the point of science, right? It's generally not how it works. Well, what do you think of the idea that if there is fusion, then fiber number would go down? 
Well, it depends on how fusion's occurring, right? So now you're getting into nuance, but yeah, just run basic math. <laughs> like, two goes into one. What happens? Total right. Number. right. Um, I mean, we know that it goes down with aging generally, right? So we look at 25 year olds versus 65 year olds. Now, 85 year olds, that number is going to go down. Um, we also, again, know that it goes up in those other instances in specific cases. So um, I would believe that there is some amount of damage and that there's some amount of like, hey, this fiber is salvageable, but not ready to function on its own anymore, fused to another one. Mm -hmm. um, maintain resources, maintain ribosomes, maintain um, nuclei, things like that. I 100% believe that seems like a very smart thing to do, to not just give up all the resources out of a fiber, to recycle things. Um, but to be the pure explainer, I don't, know if I, I don't know if I would give it that much either. Right, right. Now, um, the issue of damage, skeletal muscle damage or skeletal muscle injury um, and muscle, uh, muscle fiber hypertrophy, um, Mike Roberts says it's not needed. You don't need to necessarily damage or injure, injure skeletal muscle fibers to induce growth. Although it seems to happen coincidentally. Um, the A lot of the animal work we did way back when, we we actually saw visual evidence. I mean, we didn't even have to buy a, we didn't even have to do a cross section. You could look at a muscle and you could see it was damaged. I mean, there was, you know, bruising and whatnot. And it accompanied quite a bit of hypertrophy and in some cases, you know, increase in muscle fiber number. So the idea that you need damage for hypertrophy, what are your thoughts? And if it's not needed, does it, does it help? I mean, because we know eccentric loading, you know, you know, causes damage and there's a stimulus there for hypertrophy. So thoughts on that? Yeah. So a um, couple of things. Number one, Mike, Mike's done a ton of work in this area. Um, I defer to a lot of this stuff, but it, I think it's clear at this point, both those things you said are true. It is absolutely clear muscle damage, especially from resistance and tension-based damage, is going to result in hypertrophy. Like that, that relationship is clear. What I think people miss the boat on here, and I'm probably guilty of this, is saying, yeah, okay, but we pushed back too hard on that, such that, um, yes, there's no linear relationship here between slightly more damage equals slightly more growth slightly more damage more growth it doesn't go up that way so more growth does more damage does not equal more growth that's the top of the curve though that's not the bottom of the curve so the bottom of the curve still means like some damage means growth for sure it just doesn't scale perfectly up there and so that's the part where i think we've confused people a little bit and thinking oh i don't have to have any damage or at all or if i have any damage it results in no growth that's not at all true it right. clearly is there clearly it's just that once you get especially to moderate or high uh, you know, annihilation is not necessarily more effective than stimulation. Right. I think that's that's very clear. True. I also think now you're getting to the point, which is really cool with what Mike's been able to do with some of these new assays and saying, OK, there's probably different. Depending on when you measure the muscle fiber, you're probably seeing different methods or, or modes rather of hypertrophy. This is a sarcoplasmic stuff that he's saying. Is it a fluid issue? Is it edema? Like, do we have contractile units there? And I think you, we're getting closer to going, oh, this like his review paper a couple of years ago, like, oh, this makes a ton of sense, right? Early changes, first couple of weeks versus six months versus six years in, all that model starts to look like it makes intuitive sense. It makes teleological sense. Like that makes sense that a lot of water early and then, hey, like more contractile proteins built a little bit later. So I think, I think you have to consider where out on that curve those people are when they're getting that stuff done. Um, so that being said, I was actually just, I was trying to glance real fast. I literally was reading a paper this morning and it, it's totally blank in my, it'll come to me in five minutes or something. But there was a new thing that came out on a, a new protein identified as being important to um, the molecular mechanisms associated with mechanical tension. Um, it, it particular protein opens the ion channels to, to get it moving. And I was like, I'm like, now what is it called? Uh, it starts with a P, it still in my mind. But point is there is like, again, hundreds of papers and tons of mechanisms known with simply mechanical tension. If you stretch the cell membrane specifically resistance exercise, do it on a hanging stretch. Just hang them there for weeks and days. Like it's going to induce muscle growth in almost every case um, per everything else is appropriate and yada, yada, right? So uh, I think to me, that's the best way to think about that is um, some damage is not necessarily required, but it's going to result in some growth, but excessive extreme to the max is, is not necessarily going to be that much more advantageous, especially if you consider the practical implications of, did you get so sore that and then results in reduced training the next session or the session after that. Now you're going to compromise a lot of stuff. So 
now you're gonna have problems. But um, at the same time, you gotta work. Like something has to be challenged here. And so if yeah. you're not doing enough to insult any any sort of right. yeah. insult, then we're not gonna get growth either, unless we're, again, doing other things. Yeah, because there are, I mean, because there are sports where um, most of the movement is concentric. You can take mm -hmm. rowing, you can take cycling, and they get hypertrophy. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's so many, it's sort of like, you know, all, you know, many roads lead to Rome. There's so many ways to induce hypertrophy. Definitely. Uh, you know, the, the, the high rep, low load versus uh, low rep, high load stuff. Now, sort of a pragmatic question I'll ask both of you. Um, if they both induce similar hypertrophy, so high reps, low load versus, and let's take the extremes. Let's say it's 30 reps versus three to six reps. Why would you waste your time doing 30 reps? <laughs> so Tony, Andy, I, who does that? There, there are some cases. Um, I, I will, I will play the other side a little bit here. The what you're getting at for background for everybody. Um, eat, let's just assume it is equal muscle growth. It's yeah. clearly not going to have equal muscle strength. Right. But that the lower repetition range is going to massively favor strength gains. And so you can make the argument that I'll get similar growth, but if you're at all concerned about strength, then the, the lower upper range is clearly a favorite. Now that said, there are unique cases. So there are different times of the year. Um, there is, I've trained so long, I just need variation. There are major things that we're dealing with right now. I've had a handful, one of the NFL quarterbacks that I coach uh, had a massive, massive injury this year, lower body. And um, we're gonna have to go to some really high repetition stuff to try to get hypertrophy because loading is not going to be an appropriate or smart thing. Right. And we have, and we've done that. Right. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to blow some people away with, with his return to the, to the game. All right. So there are situations like that. Um, there are situations we've done in things like, and not myself, but colleagues of mine with the astronauts going up in a NASA when we don't have load, it's not available. It's not around. Right. So we can now get some stuff done where preserve preservation of muscle size is critically important. And we can get there through higher repetition ranges. And so there's some other, like, I could rattle off a bunch more, but there are definitely some use cases where that's really cool information to know. Um, but if you were to stack them up and you're just like, no, I'm just kind of working out or I'm just, I'm in general physical preparation, then yeah, like, why not do the same work and get the strength gains as well? Exactly, yeah. So it's fine to me, what are your thoughts? Yeah, not exactly the same. I, I To me, there are going to be instances if you cannot load and then the increase in repetitions would be preferable for blood flow too. They, there are some advantages there, right? If, if particularly to uh, Dr. Andy's point about recovery from an injury. And if you have to induce hypertrophy and you have no other option, great. Otherwise uh, I would avoid it, you know, with athletes training at super high volumes because it's just, it's, I, I want to decrease the total duration in which they're training for one thing too. So I think it has its use. I would never rule it out. I think those were excellent examples, but if I can restrict the set, to, you know, I'd probably, the way I would work that is probably, and I know you're a fan, Andy, of this, uh, more in a cluster set fashion would be my way of potentially approaching that high repetition volume if needed. But I, I think it has its place if the athlete is healthy, if the athlete is already under uh, very large training volumes and intensities, yep. then I want to limit the total time and duration of the workout if I can. So I'll stay with the heavier loading, get the strength. And in the sports I work in, hypertrophy is not necessarily an objective anyway. But if yeah. it were to be, I like the volume training. I, I, I think it does have a place at times. Yep. I'll be candid. I mean, I do it a lot when I travel. Just well, so that I can get like the largest, biggest pump like <laughs> ever. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you're going to go and give a talk or whatever. It's just like you're just cranking out as many push-ups as you can in your hotel room because you got nothing but 15 pound dumbbells. And you're just like, all right, I guess we're going for sets of 40. You're like, here we go. <laughs> I'm just going to get after it. Um, so I, I, I would say, yeah, anecdotally, I'll say this. When I was younger and used to train hard with weights, man, sets of like 20 would, yeah. I, the next day, I, my legs, I, literally, I couldn't get my pants on now. That's yeah. super compensation from the glycogen, the, you know, the, the fluids, and but it, I got to tell you, man, you, you're going to do some hypertrophy with those loads for sure. Yeah. You know, the ironic part, you know, Andy, you're a bit younger than Tony and I, but it sort of goes back to PE class, Tony. Remember we did calisthenics? Yeah. It's basically just high volume calisthenics. <laughs> that's Dude, that's, actually, that's good up. because that, that answer is like, I hope I, I wish we could clip that out and I could give that to half the people on my social media. Cause I get those questions all the time about like, 
whenever we talk about weights and I get this, the inevitable, oh, but my friend only does yoga and look how jacked he or she is. I'm like, oh God, like <laughs> it's still like, if you're doing a hundred pushups, you're doing a hundred pushups. Like it's just, <laughs> it's still going to work. Like it's still like, exactly. like your body weight is still, of course it's effective. <laughs> Absolutely. It's effective. Yeah. Yeah. Those things. Yeah. So, uh, let me ask you this in terms of staying on the, the muscle damage, muscle fiber injury, uh, topic, uh, vis-a-vis -vis supplements. So there are supplements out there that can decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. Maybe they have an effect on decreasing inflammation. What are your thoughts on, and let's, let's focus first on performance sports. Then we could do uh, bodybuilding. Yeah. Do you want to, well, decreasing DOMS and decreasing inflammation. What are your thoughts? Performance sports and bodybuilding. Right. I can handle the first one for sure. <clears throat> That's what I spent my entire career on. Um, I have almost no experience training personally or coaching anybody in a physique sport. I've never, I don't think I've ever done that. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll make some jumps of assumption there, but I can yeah. talk to you about my personal experience in this side. We bucket this into two phases, right? Are we optimizing? Or are we adapting? That's the very, very key question we're after, right? So if we're trying to optimize, what I mean by that is something like, I want to peak performance right now. I am in season. NFL guys are in season right now. Major League Baseball players are in the offseason. Our PGA guys are in the offseason. So we have different setups here. Um, some of our fighters are in or off, like camp, whatever, right? If I'm in fight camp, if I'm in uh, football season right now, we are optimizing, right? So if, if, if we are sore or tired or fatigued, I don't care what it takes. We're going to try to reduce that back off okay. because we have to peak right now. And if this compromises some muscle Makes growth, yeah. I do not care at all. Do not care at all because stiff mm -hmm. and tired and sore in competition. We only have so many of them, like not going to work. Right. Last six weeks before a fight or three weeks or whatever you want to do it. Like we're, we're, we're peaking. We're optimizing PGA guys, major league baseball guys are just getting back and started. They're just getting going. Right. So in this case, we're causing adaptation. We're trying to overreach. We're trying to overstretch a little bit sore and tired. Good. Right. Can I get something for recovery? No, you can't. We're not blunting that signal at all. We are not letting anything compromise the long-term aspect of this, which is, in this case, muscle growth or endurance or more mitochondria or whatever the heck we're trying to train for, right? So the general answer is when we're far away and we're trying to create adaptation, we stay away from any supplementation for the most part. Um, this is any anti antioxidant. This is anything in that uh, ability to blunt muscle growth signals. Like we're just, we're just walking away from it all, right? Um, the only caveat would be if you've really, really overshot it. And I, I remember this happened one time to my wife. Um, she did the old read the sets and reps backwards thing. You know what I mean? When you're like, like you write, you write you like, uh, uh, oh, instead of three by 10, she did 10 by three or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. But it was more like, um, it was something crazy. I think it was like four by 15 or something. So she, but she, so she did some like absurd number. Right. And she's just like, she made some ass up and she came like i'm working and she comes out of the gym which is our our, our garage and she just is like shaking she's just like i did a boo-boo i'm like what and then she told me and i was like oh my gosh so she did like german volume training on accident with her normal like four by four load and so she's just like a disaster right. and it was like probably i don't even know a week and a half before she wasn't a mess wow so in that particular case it's like all right we've 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 way gone overboard here you're gonna you're gonna miss too much etc like we we're talking about earlier, we're gonna we're gonna ice bath. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and do whatever we need to do. I mean, N sets at that point, like it's just like we're we're not we're like who cares, right? We're backing off. So I think kind of all those scenarios are how we think about it. Again, really, really overshot it, and mm -hmm. you're just really struggling. Okay, fine. Um, in that case, honestly, go to like pharmacy. Like go to pharmacy. Don't go to like I'm not going to rhodiola. Like you're like we're going to something that's gonna really work. Yeah, yeah, in like yeah, a yeah. massive amount right now. Outside of that, though, or if we're trying to cause adaptation, we're staying away from it for the most part. Or if we're trying to peak, then then we'll potentially use something. So, yeah, quick question on it. That, that is, and that makes great sense too, the way you're uh, treating it individually and, and what the priority becomes. Do we have an, an idea on the window of how long that inflammatory process must? You know, so let's say if um, hypothetically it's there on Tuesday, you had a, your golfer and a PGA tour guy work real hard on Monday. 
And um, they had something they had to do on Wednesday, maybe just some practice, and they didn't want to be too sore for that. Could we blunt it 24 hours after? Is that sufficient? Or do we know if there's a duration in which most of the primary signaling mechanisms have been achieved or, or we're not sure yet? That's, so that's a great question. If you think about the mechanisms of how muscle growth works, the very first thing that has to happen past the stimuli, and the stimuli is either, let's say, exercise or a testosterone, so, so, some, something, right? Like one of Let's just say stimuli, it doesn't matter, okay? Immediately, and I'm talking within seconds, you've got signaling proteins getting fired mm -hmm. off, right? So you, you can get that within seconds that's happening there. Depending on which one you look at, they're gonna be optimized again within seconds to minutes of exercise, right? So while you have to biopsy at super specific times post-exercise, you're gonna miss the signaling cascade window. Um, that all said, some of them aren't peaked right. until several hours. Okay. Right? Yeah. Then that signaling protein has to tell the nucleus to replicate DNA. Ribosomes got to get going. That, that whole cascade has to happen. That genetic process is peaked somewhere in the four to eight hours. Okay. But that's like a super easy thing to say to undergrads. The honest reality is that is a giant window. Yeah. That is a big, yeah. big window. And there are so many genes involved in that. And we don't have that much data. That's actually honestly one of those things where it's based on a couple of studies. We're like, mm -hmm. oh, the optimal time is four hours. Then it's like everybody does four hours because they can right. reset the same studies. But like, I don't know that that's true in trained men. Right. I don't know that that's true in trained women. I don't know that that's true at all. Like I know it's with training like those couple of studies, but like, that's not like I just stamped a hundred percent. That's just physiology, how it works. It's like something I always say, but that's, that's not like a, at, at this level is like, I don't know if that's actually true. Third part then is it has to go through protein synthesis. Now that part, again, you can look at the data there and you're going to see what guys, four hours to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. That process is still alive. Is it optimized? No. Is it still alive? Yeah. Yeah. So do you really say we're not going to introduce anything until past that 48 hour window? Again, we're just putting round kind of numbers on it. Right. It doesn't literally mean it's like, that's how it is for everybody. So it is really, really tough. I think it is a, to summarize all that, I would say, if you wanted to do a cold, hard number and just say 48 hours, it's like pretty reasonable. But at that point, you're, you're two and a half days out now, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay like right. oh god i got it probably back to training again anyways hopefully and of course all the behavioral factors would impact that are they sleeping are they eating are they fluids and cars yeah, right? nutrient like, so availability that... stress management globally and sleep right. a ton yeah like i mean i could like to go for hours on sleep data that's why i spent a lot of time on it now so but yeah anyways that, that's the answer i'd give to that really good question no, that's great yeah you have to coach here's honest answer. you got to coach like yeah Every such as evidence based is not just like, what did the one study, you know, say in right. the one control group of six old people eight years ago? It's like, right, right. take your situation. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, what's interesting about the whole, the whole evidence based, I, I guess the word community is it. Uh, maybe that's the wrong term, but um, there are those in our field that that treat quote the evidence based. You got to be evidence based. You got to have data. Almost like a cult, like yeah. unless there is a study on it, you can't make the recommendations. And, you know, working with fighters, I mean, Tony, you know, you're never going to have a study that's an RCT on professional fighters. It does not exist. So it has to come from coaching. It has to come from, um, you know, trial and error. That's the only way you'll get this information. Like the data, Andy, oh, by the way, thanks for posting that, that paper we did with the UFCPI. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was totally an accident, by the way. I, I even forgot we were doing this. It wasn't on purpose. Uh, okay. yeah. I just went back into it. It's for, one of those where they have data and it's just data they've collected. We helped put it together, you know, did some stats on it. But at the end of the day, it's it's trial and error for particularly for elite athletes. All of it's trial and error. I mean, there's yeah, you're just not going to run an RC. Imagine running an RCT, you know, uh, Tony, you're, you're, you're getting someone re uh, ready for a uh, a uh, fight, you know, working with Chris Weidman, you know, imagine, hey, Chris, can we do something to you? And we'll, we're going to have a control group here and and we're going to see which works better. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And then we're going to cut your calories and fluids while you're getting punched in the head and, you know, see what those are. So. Yeah. No, like we were on, we just submitted a paper over the weekend um, on sleep data for combat fighters around the world. And so that's part of why I was like, and then I, I went, I was like, oh, I know. I Corey published a paper on this and went back and read it. And I was like, man, this was so good. Like I got to, I think I posted about it when it first came out, but I just want to throw it back out there. Cause it was so, so nice. And it's so hard to do studies like that. It is with those people. If you look at the sleep research in general, 
there's very little research on high performing athletes in sleep. It's very hard to do for a bunch of reasons. And if you look at even like, um, you guys probably remember, um, Sherry Ma's like sleep extension research out of Stanford, right? This is the classic. If they gave, they had the Stanford basketball team, uh, sleep at two hours extra a night for like six weeks during the season. And it was like 9% improvements in three point accuracy, free throw percentage, yeah. Uh, yeah. like reaction time goes up. Like this is massive improvements across the board by getting these kids to sleep a couple more hours. Right. And then people over the years have like criticized it, which is fine. Like every paper has a limitation. That's just, again, that is the nature of science. The people are like, Oh, there's no control group. It's like, okay, great. Which control group was the coach going to let them go in? You're the, you're going to be in the group who doesn't sleep as much. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No coach is doing that ever right like so in her paper she's like yeah we couldn't blind them either what are we going to do like right. like, like the, the you pretend is, to sleep you actually sleep yeah, yeah like what are you going to do here it's like of course there's placebo effect here of course but like you want data on real performing athletes in real life situations you, you, to me like that's not a bigger flaw than there is with the flaws associated with you know, bigger clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Cause now those, you just have the ecology argument backwards. Okay, great. Well, how do we know any of that work? Well, you don't like, okay, right. so like, yeah, you, you, the whole point of science is that we do all of it. And then you take the aggregate yeah, of exactly. what is there. And then you coach based on your experience. What's crazy about this dude, you guys, sports science dudes, think about this. If you do anything nutritionally recommendation, whatever supplementation wise, and it's not extremely documented in a paper you're gonna you get fried for right mm -hmm. everyone goes after you but no one does that for training if you do something like you know four sets of, of six point. like yeah. and it hasn't been documented nobody cares it's like well yeah that's reasonable like but if you just like recommend something slightly like not completely thing you're just like fraud <laughs> it's like oh, all right like have you ever worked with somebody ever Oh yeah, I work with athletes. Really? Oh yeah, you had like a 16-year-old kid one time playing soccer. Right, exactly. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> well, you know, Andy, to that point, I once walked into the lab. I saw Tony doing uh, uh, back squats, but he was holding a flower pot, pot on his head, and he was saying, "Hey, look, I can balance this." No, I'm just kidding. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but I was believing every part of that story. <laughs> I believe every part of it. Those are the kinds of videos you see on Instagram. I'm like. Yeah. What the hell are these people doing? It's funny as hell. Funny as hell. By the way, your dog seemed to be wanting to get the hell out of your office. They're like, yeah, she's she's stuck in here right now. There's people out there. And she's sorry. Hey, um, pragmatic question because people will will want to know uh, supplements other than create uh, other than creatine, caffeine, and let's say protein that in general you recommend for the uh, general fitness enthusiast. They just work out. They feel better. They want to get in better shape. So. Anything not including creatine, caffeine, and protein, since that's sort of the go-to for most people. Yeah, I mean, the one that's going to jump out is next would be omega-3s, right? Mm -hmm. Like, again, that's nothing's cool. perfect, but yep. mountains of data there. When I'm answering this question, I'm thinking cost versus likely to have positive effect versus likely to have negative effect, right? Versus am amount of evidence. So something like omega-3, pretty high in cost, relative. Okay, fine. But likely to have lots of benefits in a lot of different areas, Yep. unlikely to do anything bad like it's just like not going to do anything bad unless you get to really high levels and we're in this like hypertrophy situation right now we're maybe blocking hyper okay like sure but oh an aggregate there um not 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 a ton of downside that'd be on the list you probably throw a vitamin d for the same exact reasons you could go very high levels of vitamin d with almost there are some there's actually a couple papers um that have showed the so vitamin d is is interesting it is the, the one of the major points of vitamin D is that it, it is a storage molecule. Do you, so do you is, get it for uh, supplementation or from the sun, Andy? Of course, anything from the world that you can like always get the more things you can get from the world, from, from air, from water, from being around friends to eating whole foods. Like this is always, always, always the win. Right. But vitamin D is, is nuts. There have been a couple of papers on looking at heavy metals and vitamin Ds. And so one of the things that can happen, and I'm intentionally telling you this because this is an extremely unlikely scenario, but this is like kind of fun to think about, is vitamin D will help you store things. And so if you are exposed to high levels of heavy, heavy metals, vitamin D staying low in your body is an intentional way of your body trying to keep vitamin D low so it can actually rid the heavy metals. 
So if you are in the presence of a couple of different micronutrient insufficiencies and high uh, heavy metal and vitamin low, low vitamin D, it's trying to keep it down. So you smash yourself with 10,000 IUs of vitamin D a day and your, your vitamin D level doesn't go up. Well, one of a couple of things is happening. One, most likely, you're probably getting it from a crappy supplement provider. And there's probably like not that much vitamin D actually in it. That, that can happen. Or your body's intentionally trying to keep it low because it's trying to rid yourself of toxin. Now that said, you're talking about like, I think there's like two papers on that. Wow. So almost Rare. surely there's like a 99.9% .9 chance just taking vitamin D is fine. Like it's like almost, only in those like extreme situations. And that's only been shown a couple of times um, and not like super recently. So it's never been followed up with us. was always to me like a sign of like, when the research doesn't follow a field, doesn't always mean it's nothing's there, but a lot of times it means like, and maybe nothing's really there. So outside of that though, you have almost no issues with vitamin D. So that'd go high on the list. And the last one would maybe be like a multivitamin, uh, but you actually want to maybe be a little more careful there kind of depending, but um, yeah, those, those are on the kind of general list of probably fine to take. Tony, any thoughts? No, I, I, I probably would go the same way. Um, you know, and, and I think the key thing is cost and limiting and, and the most, what you're going to get for the dollar or potentially what that person may need most because getting people to take six, seven different supplements a day becomes impossible too. So yeah. you got to make those choices based around where the potential deficiencies may be. Um, but I'm a big omega-3 advocate and, and vitamin D. I mean, those are, those are foundational. So I, I don't think I could offer anything to the general fitness population that would be novel from there. And, and yeah. again, to Andy's point too, get outside, get some real air, get some real sun, see some nature, Oh, and do the best you can on, you know, the foods that actually were alive at one given point. And you probably cover, you got a good foundation from there on in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. We use a lot of supplements for our, our performers, but the performance, we, yes. don't, we don't have any budget on these people. So right. like our pro athletes or the people on our rapid right. health performance program, like it's not a budget issue. And in fact, we're in the, Hey, if you can take me something that is likely to affect me two or 3%, I don't care if it costs a thousand dollars a month. Right. I don't care at all. Right. They're making 30 to 40 to 50 million a year. Like that's not a relevant number at all. Yeah. Um, so, but that's a different question. Right. Yeah. yeah for high, high performing athletes. Um, yeah. With no, with where budgetary concerns don't matter. Uh, I usually recommend everything, even if it has a minor, minor, minor chance of helping. Um, you know what? Wife, I want to yeah. say something here because I, I specifically, and will never forget you saying this on stage, probably 20 years ago. This may have been at NSC, NSC. had it been at NSC. NSC. Um, and I remember you saying, if it has a neutral or positive effect, we're going to take it. Yeah. And I was like, and it was like so different than anything anyone had ever <laughs> said before. And I was like, wow. And it totally flipped my mind. I'm like, what if, what if I thought like that? Why not? But it has the potential to help limited damage. And all I'm losing is money. And some people, like, that's it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, taking a pragmatic approach to a lot of this stuff will, um, I think, particularly for the high end athlete, works quite well um, because for them, they're looking even for a 0.1% mm -hmm. improvement. I mean, in, in some of these road races, whether it's cycling or running or whatever, you're talking about difference between first and second place oftentimes yeah. is not even a second. So I always ask people, well, how do I train to be one second faster? Well, you just keep doing what you're doing and hopefully you'll beat that person. That's all you can do. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that's the margins, man. That's, that's what yeah. we're at. That's the game we're playing at. So um, yeah, if we got a potential to do that for something that's fairly easy to get done. Um, now, no, there's no free passes in physiology. Everything is doing something. But, you know, you're taking the shot based on the best available events you have. And that's that's just what yeah. we call coaching. Yeah. Now, um, changing topics, I want to talk briefly about a paper that you guys you're the you're the senior author or last author. Um, the title of the paper, just so the audience is aware, is uh, prevalence of adulteration in dietary supplements and recommendations for safe supplement practices. And I really have just two pragmatic questions. And I'm going to uh, first read uh, one of the sentences in the abstract. Uh, it says, analytical studies have found anywhere from 14 to 50% of samples analyzed from dietary supplement products have tested positive for anabolic agents or other prohibited substances. So I have two questions. The first one is, 
are the levels high enough to test positive so that it affects your ability to perform, uh, to participate in the sport? That's the first question. And the second question really applies to the 99.99% of people who don't give a shit. <laughs> Their question is, will it make me better? Yeah. Are the levels high enough that it's actually anabolic? So, so 99.99% of the population are like, oh, if it's adulterated, I'm going to take this stuff because I might get bigger. The the professional athletes like, oh, shit, I can't take this stuff because I might test positive. Now, OK, yeah. So thank you. Um, I wish we could, we could have gone back and added some sentences to that uh, paper, as always you do. Right. A couple of things. When you hear numbers like that, you're talking about research from studies across the globe. That's not just studies in America. Mm -hmm. If you look at the data of adulteration in America, it is significantly lower than those numbers, right? So you're talking about um, studies and supplement providers and samples and labs in India, in China, in Ireland, in South America, like all over the place, right? So some of them have stronger or less stringent rules. There's another major misnomer here, and that is that like supplements are not FDA regulated. People say that stuff all the time, like it's yeah. completely the wild west, right? Which is objectively not true. Like it is completely false. Um, they're not regulated the same way, but there is a ton of oversight. Uh, I mean, trust me, I, I have a relationship with, with um, uh, conflict of interest. I have a relationship with momentous supplements. Um, you guys have all, you guys have both worked deeply, deeply in those worlds. There is a lot of money in oversight on those things. It's not the same as a pharmaceutical drug, but it's not, it's not just a free pass either. So that's the first point. That number is probably larger and more alarming than, than, than we should have wrote it, right? That, that's probably what way to say it. Two, is it technically adulterated versus is that even enough to cause you to fail a drug test, right? So there's two levels there, right? If you go into a lab and you run a sample through a mass spec, and we see some small amount of an anabolic agent or something. If you then ingest it, well, then you flag of a certain. So there has to be lots of levels up there before it gets to that level of you failing a test. And so that falls down a lot as well. Again, the, the ability for you to go in as a, uh, a third party certifier or something finds some level at a very small amount of any number of adulterated uh, components, actually getting a new filling test is, is a lot lower as well. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of you buying a high quality, reasonably large brand in America and failing a drug test because of it is very small. It certainly has happened, right. but it is very, very unlikely. You're, you're almost surely fine. When you go to other countries, I can't speak to that. It's, it's different. Um, of course, but here, like you're probably fine. So that's the first question. The second one was like, is it enough to give me a boost? I don't know because the bigger problem with supplementation is dosages. And this is, is the real issue. I, I feel like we probably drew the story out on like, you're going to get tainted supplements too much and didn't draw the story out enough on, are you sure you're getting the active ingredients in the amount you think you are? Sometimes high, sometimes low. Like depending, like the melatonin one is the easiest example. Plenty of data showing anywhere between a 10 to 100 X or more high or low amounts of melatonin than you think you're in your melatonin. And so you think you're taking three milligrams of melatonin, you could be taking a 10th of that, a hundredth of that, or a hundred X that. And that is, there's a ton of papers on that. Again, you're probably fine if you're buying these things that, from a, any number of big companies, but when you get outside of that, it becomes a problem. And, and I can tell you right now, having done tons and tons and tons of urine samples and people we'll see melatonin concentrations, 50 X reference range the next morning. And you're like, Oh, what the hell happened? Like, Oh, you take melatonin. Yep. I take one milligram. Some like some small dose. And you're like, no, you don't like, cause unless you don't have a half-life, like any normal physiology, nine hours later, like there's, this is absurd amount. So that I think is, is probably the bigger concern. So will it benefit you? It depends on if the active ingredient is actually in there or not, or what taint is actually in there. So yeah. Um, yeah. What's interesting is, uh, I don't know if you even know this, but I used to own a coffee company. So this I was back, yeah, <laughs> from like the early 2000s and we grew it, managed, and we sold it out in 2009, I think. Um, but I learned the coffee business and that um, even within coffee, and actually this applies to all foods, there was a certain amount of poop, literally that was allowed per pound of coffee. Uh, obviously oh, yeah. it didn't make you sick or I remember there was a certain amount of mold and mildew it's like and that's all food so when I when I see see um, you know articles about adulteration I'm thinking but that's food food it happens to food as well 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just made Dave Asprey smile. Him and, oh, oh, he's the guy that's all about the, the coffee mold and then like it's not actually real, right? Like it's very uncommon. Yeah, it's not enough to matter, as I would say. <laughs> um <laughs> you have a whole thing, whole bunch of things in your physiology that are you know meant to take care of those things and at super small levels occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um yeah. okay, we're we're running out of time. Just a couple couple uh, topics to cover. One, as you know, the the social media has made it very democratic to, you can get information out easily from anyone. Now, the, the, the good part is there's so many people giving advice and the bad part is, well, there's so many people giving advice. So how, what do you tell students in terms of, hey, uh, Dr. Galpin, um, so-and-so said I need to sit in a cold tub and so-and-so said I need to do zone two training so I could live longer. And and how do you, how do you tackle that knowing that oftentimes the, this is a misinterpretation or a weird extrapolation of data. Yeah, super challenging. The way that I always say it is um, you start with humility. If you go back through my career, even the just take within that course that you're in and you go back to enough slides and enough exams and enough things, enough years, you'll see I've changed some things. Mm -hmm. So I can't promise you anything that I'm saying right now is 100% right. It's going to be wrong. So I'm wrong on something right now. I don't know what it is I'm wrong about yet, but I'm going to in five years or 10 years from now. So number one, we always have to approach some humility here. We're learning, we're progressing, we're changing, right? Uh, any number of examples there. That's the start. So secondly, stop then assuming things are blanket rights, yeses and nos at all times. Okay? There's, we keep that little flag for humility there, whatever, maybe. When you don't know what to do, then we start with, basic underarching approaches like is this something that is generalizable against the human race is this a is this a normal human thing right does this make teleological sense does this make evolutionary sense does this make biological sense does this make um ancestral sense doesn't we don't want to fall into the fallacy of nature here right because just because it's natural doesn't mean it's right or good right that's a huge logical fallacy but like we we can start inferring things from there um the the, the examples of like uh, an ice bath. Okay, great. I have a giant ice bath right out there. I've had it for a decade. I love this stuff, right? But that said, it's not a panacea like anything is. Like you really think all humans have to be in an ice bath to live a healthy, high-performing life. Like that would be absurd to think, right? You do not need anything like that. That's I why we moved it. to Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a whole garage that's nothing but weights and training equipment, right? You don't have to live weights to be healthy, but mm -hmm. like, Okay, sure. But then there are things that do that have provided general things. Um, when you look at the case of exercise, it's not a natural thing. That said, look what's changed in our lives compared to before when we never exercised. And now there's a clear logical relationship that says we had to insert something back in our lives because it got taken, it got taken out. So it makes sense. So exercise isn't natural. Sure, it's not natural, but it actually was way more natural, be way more physically active since that's got down. This is our replacement. So like, like we're just sort of filling a similar yeah. gap. The ice wouldn't make that sense, right? You can make it a little bit of argument. You used to probably get a lot colder, yeah, yeah, okay, but you, you're not like, you're, you're doing some stretching like pretty heavy here. So think about it from there. Um, the second one is evidence base should and always should be interpreted as a combination of multiple things. Again, what's the research say? What are the experts? applying in that field say, and then what is your own personal experience say, mm -hmm. right? So um, terminal degrees and related fields may you not mean anything, right? Again, you, you got a dissertation in muscle physiology technically, but yet pretty well versed in nutrition. Okay, that can happen, most definitely, but there's no guarantees there, right? Yep. Like, there's no guarantees that you even know much about your own individual field. So it's a hard thing. Um, you're never gonna get it perfect is the easiest way to think about it, right? You're going to make some missteps there. Um, but there, there's clearly a pattern between, um, let's just say, terminology or degrees or certain concerns. In fact, I, uh, how do I say this? Um, like I recently became aware of somebody who I thought was doing really great work in this field and realized that individual does not have the actual um, academic background that, that I actually thought, not even close. And was like dug in and I was like, oh my God, this person doesn't have a degree. And like, I just thought they, which doesn't mean anything, 
But I was like, that's why that person makes all these mistakes all the time on social media is always putting stuff out there. I'm like, really? You should know better on this. But I'm like, oh, they don't actually. Right, right. Stunning. Okay, great. Great, great, great. So um, it happens probably more than you think. Again, a PhD means nothing, like per se on his face, like doesn't mean anything. Um, you could be a total nitwit with a PhD in nutrition, like we've seen a billion of them. Oh, it's yeah. Uncommon. I always tell people, don't, uh, uh, don't fall in love with your letters. Too many people, they fall in love with their letters and they think their letters guarantee, you know, omniscience. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <Just work> it. <laughs> it's a step in the right direction for sure, but like it's not, it, it's not anything, so... Um, yeah, hard, it's hard, hard to like, get untangled yeah. even because I'd say if you go back to things I've said on podcasts enough years ago, I might go, yeah, I actually, yeah, may I don't agree with that anymore. So right, right. it's a moving field. Um, but, you know, in essence, it's kind of like what you said when you, you both of you said with nutrition, right? If it isn't doing any harm and it's a modality that has some potential oh. benefit and you enjoy it or you want to integrate it such as an ice bath or why not, right? It, we don't, so... I mean, that's where I am with it. Take a few things. We, um, It isn't a panacea, as you noted, but it, it certainly isn't going to, you know, it, it probably is not going to limit performance again, as long as we're not doing it eight seconds after our training session, as you said, in the yeah. adaption phase, we'll probably be okay. So the only thing, I, maybe I'll ask this better question. Um, the only thing I generally get irritated with is when people are doing the, uh, oh, okay, here it has a, this morning. I got a series of text messages from one of the athletes I coach. You're talking um, all pro. This is an all pro NFL player, like the highest current right now. And uh, was asking me a bunch of questions about water fasting. Right. Oh. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'm not going to give this the time of day, but like, those are like very genuine questions. Right. And it was like, is it true about the cancer? And I'm like, man, you're Jewish. Like, this is really, really hard. So when people do things like that, I, like to me that's extremely irritating that's irresponsible um and there should be like right professional credential blowbacks for saying things like you know fasting for whatever water you know reduces cancer by 80 percent. like like that's extremely irresponsible yeah if someone wants to go something more of like hey i like a lot of zone two training for my athletes for blah 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 okay fine now we're like it's a little bit of opinion i don't agree with it as much but like right. it's not like so if you are massively deceiving people yeah um, if you are intentionally lying and manipulating, like, like the quacks, we generally have, like, we could list them. We don't need to, I don't want to give the people any more credit. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's a handful of people we could always list every couple of years who, you know, the three of us will go like that person's like a genuine fraud. They're like, they're saying things like fast for two days and you'll reduce cancer by 80%. Like that is a, there's no justification for that saying like that complete fraud. And then there's more of like, yo, you hype this up too much. Okay, okay, that there's there's real things there like an ice bath, but you're hyping it up way too much. Up, like yeah. you're whatever. But that's not the same level as like the yeah. other one. You're like, no, you're just a straight up Gary Tubbs. Like you're just a straight up for like you don't know anything. Exactly. Like you're just yeah. completely making things up, right? Um, so there's levels there, I guess. Uh yeah. yeah there was a guy, yeah, there was a guy on Instagram who's who said he did not eat or drink for 30 days. <laughs> I'm thinking. That's usually called death. Um, yeah. <laughs> not the water part. You ain't getting through these without water. <laughs> you, you could do it without food, but you're not. Yeah. Yeah. The you water part, out. you need water. Um, uh, uh, we got to let you go soon. Uh, maybe one more question. You mentioned your supplement line with Momentus. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at all the supplements, but I have a general question about anyone who has a supplement line. Um in terms of whether or not you feel the need to do any randomized controlled trials on the products, doing product specific trials versus making third party claims. What are your thoughts on that, Andy? Yeah, totally. So I don't have a product line there. Oh, you don't? Oh. No, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't certainly never do that. Uh, what, we, what I just have is like, um, like we have a, a bundle. That's like an athlete recovery bundle. And it's like creatine, omega-3s, and multivitamins. But if you buy all three as a bundle, you get a small kind of discount on those things. So there's no products we have created. Um, no, and that's not a game I want to ever, ever get into because you would need many trials. You need mechanism trials, you need outcome trials, all those things. So the, the Momentous Partnership um, it, it's been a really solid one. I've been really impressed with those folks. But that was just a way to say, hey, like if somebody wanted to do like a baseline um general performance 
what'd you put together? And it is all the stuff you would, it is, it's Omega-3, it's creatine, it's, it's that kind of it's stuff. It's the basics. It's yep. the very, very basics, yeah. Um, like maybe some glutamine for like extreme and endurance training and recovery, like some other things like that. But yeah, that's pretty basic there. It's just a, a way to get a little bit of a discount. Hey, any plans to come to uh, this side of the country instead of being stuck on the left coast? Yeah. <laughs> um, I try to never leave my house if at all possible. <laughs> you not. sound like me. <laughs> just, like, especially these days and it's going to get, it's only getting worse. Yeah, it's cookie. I, I don't think I'm going to be out there anytime soon unless we get a fight rescheduled that gets moved but uh no i don't think so i got a couple of speaking engagements dialed up next year but um well how about what, joey know. why don't we get him issn or neurosports for the following year how's that yeah actually we, we uh, man, come out. you speak for one of uh, one of those we're organizing a uh, this would be i think it's october i forget the exact date tony it's uh third saturday of october oh yeah yeah we're actually organizing an issn fight camp uh one day seminar oh cool yeah so cool. tony well, obviously be there Corey peacock we're gonna bring some ufc fighters in just to chit chat with everyone um i know I'm busy like, y'all but maybe we drag you out for a day or two that just depends on how close to hunting season you get your chances oh, that's true. Yeah. in the fall <laughs> Wait, right. October. Is there a hiking season? Hunting season. Oh, hunting. hunting. I thought I said hiking. It was like yeah, October is hunting season. September to December, depending on what you're drawing, what you're going after. So there you, go. you like elk hunting, right? No, no, no. Andy, you could hunt for alligator. Oh, that is, that's a good time. Pythons, man. If you can facilitate, I will <laughs> certainly come. If I can get a I could double up an alligator hunt there. Because I'm uh, here for that. Yeah, October. I know a guy who might be able to tag. I'm, I'm dead serious on that. I'm so, sure you are. I'm, I'm going to take you. you up. Not only that, we might be able to take you python hunting and rid the Everglades of oh. those pythons and Burmese pythons. Oh yeah, I know those. I are think going you'll like that. I, I hate that. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I love wildlife so much. I spend so much time reading, like various state publications on wildlife updates. Um, podcast like legislation stuff going on so i know exactly what's going on with your pythons and i've, I've never all right good good the glades are fascinating um, but you got some hey. deer down there there's some deer to hunt down there oh yeah yeah this hey, let, me, let me tell you one last story about the the wildlife here i was paddling and not not far from my house maybe a half mile because i live right on the water and i saw a large alligator i mean one that would that's scary because if you see the head and you see how big it is it's like holy crap this alligator's gotta be 10 feet 10 feet long so I called Florida Wildlife, uh, I think it's called Gaming and Wildlife or something. And I said, hey, there's a large alligator. I said the address where it was. And they said, well, we can't really do anything about it until it becomes a nuisance. I'm like, yep. but it's a big alligator. They're like, yeah, but it's not a nuisance yet. So I said, so a nuisance is it kills a pet. They're like, yeah. Okay. It kills a person. Yeah. yeah that's a so, so you have to actually wait for something to happen before they remove the alligator. And I'm like, oh, shit, I, that, I don't know if I like that. No, <laughs> oh, I know. I'm aware of it. My, uh, my sister-in-law, who coincidentally just got in town last night, lives in Tampa. So it's oh, my all right, sister. And they got two little kids the same age as our two little kids. And they have, they're like in a little cul-de-sac there in uh, Tampa-ish area. And in their little pond, their little cul-de-sac, like pfft, not a giant one, but like a big enough to eat your yeah. three-year-old for yeah. sure. Yeah, they are, yeah. And they just can't do anything about it because it hasn't yeah. eaten anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. So, so basically got to sacrifice like a little dog or something. Oh my yeah. God, it's my dog. <laughs> okay, now we'll get the alligator. 100%. I don't know. That's why I stick to the mountains. I ain't like those things underwater at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time you post your little GoPro stuff, I'm just waiting, <laughs> waiting for something to pop up. And I'm like, no way, man. No way. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin, thank you so much for being on the Sports Science Dudes. Uh, Tony, any la final thoughts to? No, nah, this was great. And um, I want to say thanks because you also put out a lot of great information and you do it for free. Um, you do a lot of great, and I use it for my students a lot, and it's very appreciated. Um, it's really great stuff, and, and not a lot of people are willing to do that. So I thank you for that. You share a lot of great information and very educational resources. So it's appreciated. Nice. Right, it's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Great. 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 Great.